Victoria Sherry, and I'd like to thank everyone for um, coming to my presentation on St. Nectarius of Aena. I believe that St. Nectarius fits really beautifully into our ongoing series on contemporary hierarchs. Now, one thing I've noticed about the saints that we've studied so far is that they are all wanderers. They have no permanent home on the earth like St. Paul. Pilgrims on the earth. Uh, we started out with St. Raphael of Brooklyn, who was born in Syria, educated in Greece and Russia, and then became a missionary to America. John Maximovich of Shanghai and Paris and San Francisco was neither Chinese, nor French, nor American, but his legacy belongs to all these countries. And last week we learned about uh, St. Nikolai Velimirovich, who was unjustly exiled, as was St. Nectarios, as Rebecca pointed out, and left his mark on Serbia and the United States. These itinerant hierarchs can't be claimed by any single nation. They belong to the whole world. Their veneration is universal, and their wonders became known wherever they're orthodox faithful. And I'm going to put St. Nectarius at the forefront of this list of universal saints because we hear his name every Sunday at Orthros, for those of you who are there for Orthros, during the intercessions right after um, Psalm 50. We hear a saint of, our, of the 20th century in which many of us were born um, on equal footing with all these giants in the 3rd and 4th centuries. It's really quite amazing. Bishop Basil remembers adding St. Nectarius' name to the official Antiochian liturgicon in um, 1989, and it already appeared in the earlier um, Greek uh, liturgicon that he was working with. Here's what St. Um, Justin Popovich, a Serbian saint glorified in 2001, has to say about St. Nectarius. Indeed, it is a great miracle that in our century of unbelief and lack of faith, this metropolitan Nectarius, despised by many and humiliated to the point of death, becomes the cause of so many spiritual events and movements. No matter where the faithful call upon him and invoke him in prayers with faith, he arrived and always arrives. He heals the demon-possessed, strengthens the weak spiritually and physically, straightens and heals the lame, and saves those at sea in a storm. In a very short time, his holy name became known everywhere, on the land, on the sea, in Europe, America, and Africa. Temple, temples dedicated to him have sprung up everywhere. Many books have been written, and are constantly being written, on the hearts of the faithful and on paper. Many terminally ill people, in a moment of utter hopelessness, see an old monk, with a gentle smile who comforts them and restores hope in God's salvation. To the question, who are you, he answers, Nectarius of Aena. Now I hope some of you in the audience had a chance to see the movie uh, Man of God. Can you raise your hand if you saw the movie? I know a couple of people did. Um, by the way, that was not the first film about St. Nectarius' life. That's one of the things I learned in my research, that there was a film that ran on Greek television back in the 1960s about a um, cancer patient who was the wife, of, of course, of an unbelieving nuclear scientist who reads about the saint's miracles and decides to seek his help. It's a pretty uh, cheesy piece, but can you imagine American television running a saint's life over and over on television in the 1960s? It's really, really pretty amazing. So Man of God, if you remember it, it, it really centers in a very moving way on the sufferings and persecutions that St. Nectarius experienced in his later years. Um, and for that reason, you know, that movie and also accounts of his life, they just pass fairly quickly over his early life. So one of the things Father Paul suggested is that I look at um, those early years. And kind of inspired by this theme of the saint as wanderer, I, I put together some maps to help us follow all the places that he um, lived in to kind of help us anchor him in time and space and also to see how those early experiences shed some light on those uh, better known narratives that we hear of his later life. So he's born in the town of Salivria in Thrace, uh, which is a town 
a town in eastern Thrace. That's pretty much what the sources say. I didn't know where it was, so I, I got out the map, and to my great surprise, there it is. It's only about like 50 miles away from Constantinople. And so you say eastern Thrace. There isn't much east of Salivria. Um, in, in 1846, the year that he was born, it still belonged to the Ottoman Empire. And so even though the rest of Greece um, is liberated in the War of uh, Independence from 1822 to 1830, that really only covers the southern part of the country. All of these northern um, provinces, uh, including Thrace, are going to be under Ottoman control until the Balkan War of 1912 to 1913. And if you look at this map, this is a map of modern day Turkey in which I've written um, uh, Ottoman Empire. It, it was never freed from Ottoman control. It, it's part of Turkey today. Um, so that's, that was kind of fascinating to me that so he's really from uh, Turkey, not from Greece. Now we know that the Ottoman authorities treated the Greeks who lived in Salivria and, the, <coughs> and these um, territories of the empire as second class subjects pretty much the way they dealt with um, Christians in 19th century Lebanon, same way. Um, Saint Nectarius grew up in Salivria in poverty and he described himself as a boy, as illiterate, meaning he learned um, so little at school that he really couldn't master uh, reading and, and writing, etc. His lifelong Ottoman citizenship, and this is another thing we have to remember, he's an Ottoman citizen, contributed to some of the challenges he faced later in life when his immigration status, shall we say, becomes a little thorn in his side. There's some, a couple of pictures of um, uh, ancient Salivria, which was ruled by the Byzantines until the fall of Constantinople and the modern uh, city of, uh, Turkish city of Sevivri, as it looks today. So growing up, St. Nectarios would have seen these um, Byzantine walls and remnants um, from the imperial period as a reminder um, to the Greeks living in Salivria of this, their lofty Hellenic ideals and heritage and how far they had fallen uh, from that time. He grew up um, as Anastasios Kephalos, the fifth child of a pious Greek family. And his mother, Vasiliki, uh, shown in this photograph, and his grandmother were the ones who nurtured his devotion to the Orthodox Church. Every evening, he described this, they would cover up the windows in order to hide their candle and their icons from the Ottomans and they would recite Psalm 103 and a few prayers. And then he um, says the women would continue to pray in silence, looking up to heaven with tears running down their faces. So he comes from this very um, pious family. He also says that um, when his grandmother was reciting Psalm 50, she'd get partway through and then he'd put his hand over her mouth and say, yeah, yeah, let me say the rest. I know it by heart. So his Yaya told him that um, he could become a, um, a priest someday. And um, this kind of stimulated his desire to um, serve the church, which required him to get an education. So at the age of 13, that's, that's what he sets out to do. There's no more education he can get in Salivri. So where is he headed? He's headed to Istanbul. They make it sound like a really long journey in, in the book about his life. As you can see, it's only about 40 miles. But he has to go by ship to get around the Bosporus. And so at the age of 13, with all his possessions on his back, he's standing on the, um, the pier in slavery waiting for a ship to Istanbul. And he just has one problem. He doesn't have any money. Okay. So he's pleading with the captain to allow him uh, passage, and the captain is just not having any of this freeloading uh, nonsense, but as he tries to pull away from the shore, the, the ship will not move. It's literally uh, stuck, even though the engine is, is running. And not until Anastasius sets foot on the deck does the ship start to move away from Salivri. So he lets him on the boat, but then they come around to collect the money, and he starts to cry because he doesn't have any money. And a rich passenger sees him and pays his fare. And so this benefactor, uh, sent by the providence of God, becomes the first in a line of several men who kind of smoothed his way in life to make sure that he was able to 
fulfill his destiny. Now, during his first years in Istanbul, you can kind of see what it looked like during the 1880s. He didn't have time for schooling or even to go to church. He worked from early in the morning until late at night, delivering big bales of tobacco for a cruel employer who paid him in room and board. No cash, that was it. With no time or chance to study, he would take the paper wrappers from the tobacco bales and he would write verses that he had copied down when he lived in slavery onto these papers and memorized them. He said he went through all his sayings of the fathers and his Bible verses like seven times until he knew them by heart. When his clothes felt started to fall apart, he asked his boss for money. And his boss said, well, just, just write your parents for help. Well, he knew they didn't have any money either, so instead he wrote a letter to Jesus and he asked his neighbor to mail it. Well, the neighbor saw the address, and as he's going to the post office, he opens the letter and reads it. And the next day, um, uh, Anastasios receives a package that's marked from Jesus to uh, Anastasios with new clothes and shoes inside. So this really increases his faith that, you know, Jesus has heard his prayers. Of course, one of the great landmarks at this time um, in Constantinople, <coughs> Istanbul would be Hagia Sophia. This is how it looked. It's kind of a mess, I think, in the 1860s. But he would see the, this church almost every day and again, a reminder of his Orthodox heritage. He, um, after he his encounter with this kind of neighbor who sent him the shoes, he left his job at the tobacconist at the tobacconists, and he worked um, at this guy's shop. And finally, he had time to attend church and to make some connections there. He started learning about all the services. He'd never really heard vespers and matins. And then he had a chance to teach at the church school. So you have to picture this. He's teaching first grade, okay? Um, and then he's also attending middle school classes for himself, okay? So he's learning and also teaching at the same time. It's kind of how my grandpa uh, worked out on the prairie when he had a one-room school. Okay, and, and while he's doing this, he's still adding to his collection of patristic sayings, which he eventually publishes as a, a popular religious anthology. And his readings um, about the church, the life of the church, and especially about the saints, make him uh, begin to have this longing for the monastic life. And we constantly see him throughout his life balancing his monastic vocation with his love of teaching and his desire to serve the church. Okay, so while Anastasios Kefalas is living in Istanbul, his family moved to Chios, which is an island also under Ottoman control in the eastern Aegean, and you can see it there all the way um, on the eastern side of the sea. He moved there in 1866 at the age of 20, and for 10 years he taught at the village school. And during this time, he also pursued his monastic vocation by becoming a novice at the monastery in Pios called Naomuni. And this is another um, chapter of St. Nectarius' life that just gets passed over kind of quickly. They say, yeah, I joined a monastery. The monastery that he joined, um, Naomuni, is one of the most important um, and famous monastic foundations outside of Athos. Um, under the Ottomans, churches and monasteries were not allowed to um, uh, ring their bells. They had to use the simindrum to call their parishioners and their monks to services. And Naomani, however, was, was allowed by the Ottomans to continue to ring it, its bells. That kind of tells you how high uh, they ranked. But, so this is what the church um, looks like today, what the monastic compound looks like today. Um, it's designated, this monastery is a world heritage site today because of its extraordinary Byzantine mosaics, and we see them here in the um, apses of the main church. It's in this church that Anastasios was tonsured a monk in 1876 and given the name Lazarus. So that's his second name, and of course he has a third name. He stops teaching at this point in order to live at the monastery full time. And three years later, he receives the name Nectarios, by which we know him when he was ordained to the diaconate. Now you can see in this picture like some damage to the, uh, around the mosaics. 
This occurred during an earthquake that struck Chios in 1881. That's just exactly two years after St. Nectarius left, so he wasn't there to protect the island. Um, but before he, um, and, and one of the reasons he left was that as he was serving his first liturgy as a deacon, he met his second and most important benefactor, um, whose name was John Oremis, and he was a millionaire who lived on Chios and had been looking for him apparently for years. Okay, so remember the scene when the man pays his uh, fare on the ship to Istanbul? Um, that was the nephew of this John Horimus, and, and St. Nectarius made such an impression on him that they had never forgotten him, and they were always trying to um, search for him. So, with his help, with his patronage, um, he is finally able to realize his dream of an education, and his superiors at Naomoni give him um, a release to travel to Athens where he enrolls in high school at the age of 33. Can you imagine starting mm -hmm. high school classes at 33? He was a man with incredible persistence. The young deacon made trips back to Hios every summer to stay at the monastery and visit his family. Um, and upon his graduation, uh, John Horima said, I want you to meet a friend of mine in Alexandria. Okay, so that will be our next uh, map. Um, so he goes to um, Alexandria, which you can see all the way down there at the lower south end of the Mediterranean Sea, and makes a great impression on the patriarch of Alexandria at the time. His name was Sophronius, and, and the patriarch says, you, you need a university education. Let's go back to Athens and get a college degree. So he started college, having just finished high school. And um, he receives his diploma at the age of 39. Um, and he is already, again, continuing to write and publish orthodox books. And this is another aspect of his ministry that he continues all his life. Um, if we think about Alexandria in the 1880s, it is a far larger and more sophisticated town than Athens, which is really just kind of a backwater until the, until the 1950s. It's, it's, it's really a small town in, in Greece. And Alexandria has been sort of the cultural epicenter of Greek civilization, you know, since Alexander. Um, and it also, in the 19th century, attracted these Greeks who didn't want to live under Ottoman control. They came to Alexandria, um, where, they would, where they enjoyed greater freedom. And while he's there, um, as when he, Nectarius gets there, Deacon Nectarius, he continues to make a very positive impression on the patriarch who makes Nectarius basically his right-hand man. Uh, he, he rises very quickly uh, through the ranks here. After a year in Alexandria, the patriarch ordains him a priest and appoints him to serve in the patriarchal offices. So he's raising money, he's keeping books, he's doing all this work for the um, patriarchate. So here's a, um, a picture of Sophronius uh, IV of Alexandria. And I want to say a little bit, since Alexandria plays such a crucial role in um, what happens later to St. Nectarios, I want to say a little bit about this patriarchate. And thanks to Matthew Nemi, who did some great research on this and published it on his website, I know that by the 19th century, the patriarchate of Alexandria, which is one of the five great right, patriarchates um, of the ancient world, was basically a single diocese with one ruling hierarch and a little handful of titular bishops. Um, and so today, we think of the African Orthodox churches in Kenya, Uganda, et cetera, as being under Alexandria, but that wasn't true um, in those days. They, they didn't exist until the 20th century. And Alexandria really starts to have troubles in 1818 when its patriarch, uh, Theophilus, goes off to join the Greek Revolution and never comes back, okay? So that's the first blow there. Um, finally, the ecumenical patriarch had to depose him in 1825 because he wasn't doing his duties. Um, and then they had more problems in the 1860s. One of their patriarchs died, and then his successor, like four years later, decided to retire. 
So they're trying to pick a, a, a you know, in 1869, 1870, a um, replacement for this patriarch, and like rival factions are fighting in the streets. It's like the battle over who's going to become the next speaker of the house, only with fist fights in the streets of Cairo, if you can picture this. When one of the candidates refused to step aside, the ecumenical patriarch had to anathematize him. So they're anathematizing patriarchs around the world. Finally, the Ottoman government says, get your act together. He has the ecumenical patriarch appoint a replacement, and it's Sophronius. Um, he's chosen for the job, um, despite any objections from Alexandria, and he's actually a former ecumenical patriarch who was deposed from that post um, because of some troubles in Serbia in the 1860s. Serbia, of course, breaks away from the Ottomans um, in 1871 and establishes an independent kingdom. Well, that was not popular with the Ottomans, so Sophronius had to go, but he moves to Egypt and, uh, and takes over there. So, to make a long story short, we can say that Alexandria was in a hot mess before Nectarius ever got there, okay? By then, Sophronius was the only bishop left, okay? So, when he elevates Nectarius to bishop, you see the picture taken at the occasion of his elevation in 1889, you know, that means that he is the successor to the, to the throne. Um, this um, Pentopolis, the um, Bishop of Pentopolis, that's what they call a titular see, meaning you don't actually go and serve there. You don't actually have any parishioners. Um, you just have that title. It's in northern Libya, as we saw from the map. And so this move puts him directly in the line of patriarchal succession. Okay, if we want to understand why St. Nectarius became the target of such a vile campaign of slander and envy in Alexandria, this photograph, I think, really tells it all. You see the man in the dark beard in the center of the picture? He's the only one who's a bishop, the only one who's wearing a gold one, <coughs> and he's obviously standing beside the, um, the patriarch's right hand as his obvious successor. And you can almost see the rest of the clergy asking themselves, who is this guy? He's a nobody, an outsider from some backwater town we'd never heard of. He's only been a priest for a couple of years. He graduated from high school just a few years ago. His humble manners and his ascetic lifestyle don't fit in in a sophisticated place like Alexandria. Even worse, the people love him. He's, he's got to go. And so there is this whisper campaign against, um, against um, Metropolitan Nictadios, and Sophronius orders him to leave without any kind of explanation. And this is um, really played out in the movie, Man of God. So when Sophronius orders Bishop Nictadios to leave his post in Alexandria, he doesn't give him any reasons. He doesn't um, give him any opportunity to respond, okay? So, so Nectarius's pain and the bewilderment is, is really overwhelming. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that aspect of the story because it's so well done in the movie, but we can say, we, ne you know, we can imagine how it feels to never have a chance to defend yourself. He doesn't have any money because the patriarch stopped paying his salary once he became a bishop. That wasn't very, um, he's not, he said he, had, he was all paid up when he left. And he had nowhere to live in Egypt, so the only place he could go was back to Athens, where he attended school. Um, so when he arrives in Athens, and you can see this is the um, Attica, Attica, the peninsula of Attica and um, the neighboring islands, down below is Aenon, where he's going to live at the end of his life. The church hierarchy refuses to see him. He has no papers. He's not a citizen of Greece. Remember, he's a citizen of the Ottoman Empire. And these rumors of immoral behavior from Egypt are preceding him and kind of poisoning the well. So finally, after begging and you know, going back to people's doors time after time, he gets a priestly assignment to a church in Halkidiki on the island of Avia. And you can see it's just, um, Avia is just north of um, Attica. It's close to Athens, but um, it's very rural very beautiful and one of the most traditional and, and kind of 
backward, peasant-like parts of Greece. I was able to visit it in 2016. So here's his situation. It's like he's a top executive who travels hundreds of miles to look for a job in Wichita, right? But none of his connections show up for the meeting. Finally, someone says, well, why don't you become assistant manager at the Dairy Queen in Pratt, you know? And you say, okay, if that's all you got, right? <laughs> so yeah, he goes, he's totally overqualified for his job, and all the customers walk out the door when they see him behind the counter. And the ones who stay are throwing their straws at him, right? Because they've heard such terrible things about him. That's pretty much how things went for St. Nectarius in Avia. He then was later sent to Gallic City, this is a town I've also um, gone through, which is between Delphi, the old um, Oracle of Delphi, and the Gulf of Corinth. It's a beautiful city, fishing village overlooking the, uh, the sea. He didn't have much of, more of a positive experience there, but he did like the simplicity of the Greek people. Gradually, the saint begins to win some people over because of his gentle manner, paternal counsels, and his excellent preaching. And he finally receives an, an invitation to serve as director of the uh, Rosario's Ecclesiastical School, which is a seminary training aspiring priests in downtown Athens. Although this wasn't exactly um, an assignment fitting to a hierarch, he took on these um, duties as director wholeheartedly. And here are a couple of pictures out him, of him. They're not dated, but they're right around the time of it, the beginning and the end of his time at the seminary. While he's living in the capital of Greece, Nectarios, this is when he really becomes aware of the secular spirit that is pervading the new Greek Republic of the 19th century. And we have to remember that many leaders of the Greek Revolution were educated abroad in countries that were completely removed from the Orthodox ethos. They couldn't be educated in Greece because their universities were closed. Um, and then their European friends of Greece wanted to celebrate the democratic ideals of classical Greece um, in the war for the country's independence rather than its ancient Christian heritage that wasn't really of interest to um, uh, Shelley and Byron and the other um, uh, advocates of the Greek cause. So when he arrives at the seminary, um, a lot of the students there look at the priesthood not as a spiritual calling, but more like a paid government job with good benefits and a chance for advancement, right? This is something you can do um, if you're smart enough. And so St. Victorios, because he's such a self-effacing person, doesn't, he doesn't confront this attitude directly. He just tries to model a different example of, of what a priest can be. And the most famous example, I think this is in the movie, <clears throat> the group of students that he calls into his office on account of their misbehavior at the seminary. And they, they know they're in trouble and they're waiting for him to impose a punishment. Um, but instead, he imposes a three-day fast on himself. And they learn that this is worse than actually being punished to see their beloved um, uh, hierarch suffering while they're just going about their business, eating lunch in the trapezone. And, you know, and it, it starts to show them there's another way to um, approach things. So here's a letter one of his students at the uh, seminary wrote to a friend around 1897 about um, the director. No matter how much I try to write about his grace nectarios and his decency and kindness and innumerable other virtues, I run the risk of not being able to describe his charisma to the fullest. His personality draws me like a magnet and indeed, many of my classmates feel the same way. Without exaggeration, I tell you, he prays day and night for the salvation of the world. His dreams of the, uh, are of the eternal kingdom of God. You can see in the picture um, on the right that St. Nectarius continues to write at the cemetery, in the seminary. In fact, he composes altogether more than, I've read this, the number 5,000 hymns dedicated to the uh, Theotokos, I don't really have time for that, but um, we know that in 1905, while he's at Rosarios, he writes Agni Parthene, which is um, one of the most beloved um, non-liturgical hymns of the church. We sing it at St. George on many occasions, um, and uh, he composed that, that there. So there he is, composing. 
Um, in later years, we had um, you know, graduates of the seminary, this Rosaria Seminary that included the, um, the first metropolitan of all Greece, his name was Archbishop Chrysostomos. I'm not positive he was there while St. Nectarius was the director, but um, he is the first um, uh, metropolitan of all Greece, and he is in this post uh, just a couple years after St. Nectarius's repose. Another important thing that happens to him at, while he's director of the seminary is he's approached by a group of pious young girls who express a desire to live a more spiritual life, and they eventually determine that they want to become nuns. So he agrees to help them and start searching for a women's monastery, a place for a women's monastery on the island of Aena, which is an, about an hour's boat ride from Athens. And it's important to find a safe place because historically women's monasteries were always in Constantinople or Thessaloniki or the bigger cities where the women would have the protection of um, you know, the, the residents. They didn't live in remote spots like the uh, men for obvious reasons. And in this picture on the right, um, we see um, the only photograph that, um, that I know of of the monastery's first abbess, um, whose name was Zeni, and she was a, a, blind, um, a, girl, one, a blind girl who was really kind of the leader of this group that approached him. Okay, this slide um, shows us the site of the monastery. It sits right in the middle of this photograph. Um, you can kind of see it there. And I went there as a pilgrim in 1992, and then again in 1997, um, which changed quite a bit during that period of time. St. Nectarios um, constructed the monastery actually on the ruins of an old Byzantine foundation, a monastery called the Life-Giving Spring, and a saint named uh, St. Athanasia lived there in Byzantine times. And surrounding the, um, the, the countryside near the monastery, there's this old, ruined um, Byzantine um, town called the Peliochora, which just basically means old town or, or old village. Um, and so you can see the kind of how, the, how it must have looked before they built anything there, just these empty buildings, um, kind of reminders of the past. So there are the nun cells on the left, and when I first went there, that was pretty much all I had, the main church, which was called Aia Triada, or Holy Trinity, um, which St. Nectarius himself helped build and was completed in 1904. Um, and St. Nectarius, as he followed the progression of the monastery and became more devoted to it, he, he wrote to Naomi and he said, I, I want you to release me from your membership role so that I can um, shepherd this new monastery of Aya Triada on Aena. And so in 1908, he retires as director of the um, Rosario Seminary, and he moves into this little cell at the edge of the monastery grounds to serve as the spiritual father. And so for the next 12 years, people from all over the um, area come to visit him, ask his spiritual counsel, and go to confession. You can, um, when, if you visit Aeneta Day, you can, um, in the monastery, you can go inside his cell, and they've kind of preserved it the way it was when he was alive. Um, we see the, the couch where he seated the visitors and pilgrims who were there to confess. And down below that is his, the top of his dresser with a vigil lamp that he keeps burning and an icon of the Theotokos that he commissioned from the Danielite fathers on Mount Athos. Um, and it's recorded that Nectarios had numerous visions of the Mother of God. And so when he asked to have this icon painted, he gave him a very precise description of how it should look. Um, and when you're there today on the table is laying um, a handwritten copy of Agni Parthenos, uh, Holy Virgin. Um, and he also found time while he was at the monastery to continue his writing. And this is his writing table under, um, uh, on a, at an outdoor table under a pine tree just outside. Near the end of his life, uh, after all his trials and sufferings, um, St. Nectarius had, had one final um, uh, challenge, and that was uh, prostate cancer, which was diagnosed in 1920. He received two months of treatment, which in those days um, probably were worthless, and he decided to make a final journey to this um, monastery of 
Kurese Londisa, um, which is kind of a neighboring monastery to um, the Holy Trinity. And uh, you can walk there. I walked from St. Nectarius Monastery to this monastery in about an hour. Um, but he rode a donkey. He was so ill he couldn't walk. And he prayed to the miracle working icon, um, the Mother of God, Kurese Londisa, um, to heal him of the cancer. And the response that he received was that there would be no uh, healing for him from this ailment. And so he accepted that. Um, and he, um, before his death, he entered a hospital um, in Athens for paupers. So in other words, not a nice hospital, but just um, a hospital in Athens for the, for the poorest of the poor. And he died there um, on the Feast of the Holy Archangels, November 8th, 1920. Here's a picture of him in repose. Um, but his first miracle occurred before he ever, uh, his body ever left the hospital. A nurse took the blanket off his bed and laid it on the, um, the patient next to him. And the man immediately recovered and got up and was well. And so this was immediately got everybody's attention. Um, and when he's brought to the monastery church and his, uh, his body's laid out in the coffin for burial, there's a holy fragrance that um, fills the monastery church. So five months after his repose, the nuns decide to open his grave. They build this little chapel, the, the red brick um, chapel, and install a marble tomb, and they, but they need to open his grave in order to transfer his relics. Um, and Avicenni uh, reports that she was very hesitant to open the grave because of the stench. Uh, but she didn't share her fears with anybody. Um, um, and so the, the night before this was supposed to take place, St. Nectarios appeared in a vision to another one of the nuns and asked her, do I smell? And she said, no, your grace, who would say such a thing? Well, the abbess says so, he replied. <laughs> Tell her I'm completely whole, okay? So he always has a sense of humor here. And so the next day, when the tomb was opened, they found the saint's body incorrupt, completely whole, just as he said, as if he had, were sleeping. Um, you can see in this, in this picture, he looked the same way, and five months later. And his relics probably would have remained incorrupt, except for some jealous clergymen who told the nuns, you need to put his body outdoors in the sun, okay? Which, of course, caused it to decompose. And so um, after 20 years, um, uh, you know, an anguished mourner, like, asked him, okay? She came to his grave and asked him why, why his body wasn't still incorrupt. She heard this reply. He said, so that the world can have relics. Okay, so he, um, he didn't remain incorrupt like St. John of San Francisco, uh, but he wanted his relics to be available. So when I went back to um, Ayana and the monastery in 1995, this gigantic new church, and you can see it in the lower corner of the um, um, picture, top picture, had, had just, they had just finished construction on it. And so it was, it's almost as big as the, the original monastery all by itself. I mean, it's, in Greece, the churches aren't very big in this church. It's, it's huge. Um, in the lower picture, you can see um, the, um, the, the priests and nuns carrying his relics in procession, which they do every year on his feast day. It's, uh, it's celebrated on um, November 9th, so it doesn't conflict with the Feast of the Archangels on the 8th. And, um, Inside the church, this, this icon that you see in the church um, is, is in that um, kind of that, the newer style. This, I brought an icon that I got in 1992, which is really the older style of his um, iconography, which looks more like his photographs. You can see it's decorated with um, uh, tamata, which are those little Greek um, plates that you see hanging off icons that are basically the offerings of pilgrims to say thank you for a a miracle that he worked or a prayer that he answered. And you know, they just take these off every day and people add new ones. It just goes on and on. And then the ceilings of the church are covered with um, vigil lamps that people have brought as offerings. So it's, it's really amazing. It's just an outpouring of love. And of course, there are people there from all over the world, um, not just Greece, um, but from everywhere. So I want to end by talking a little bit about um, some of the miracles 
there are a lot of miracles. Um, but here are two of the stories that I, that I found the best. Um, one day, um, the, some of the workers at the monastery see some pilgrims going into that cell, into the um, cell that I showed you a little bit ago. And one of the women had a 16-year-old son at home who was dying of a severe brain tumor. Um, and as soon as she set foot inside the cell of St. Nectarius, she just froze. Like, she couldn't move. She wasn't in a trance. She wasn't in a stupor. You could tell she was still there. But she just couldn't say, any, say or do anything. She, and so the nuns went and got her some holy water to kind of help her come out of it. And then she told them what she had seen. She said, there's a from through the side door in the cell, an elder in, in green vestments walked in. And she didn't know that that's where the nuns kept these green uh, vestments that had belonged to um, St. Nectarius. She didn't really know anything about the saint at all. She was just there uh, to venerate him and, and learn about him. He, and he said these words to her, fear not, everything will be fine with your son. And when she went home, um, a few weeks later, she called the nuns to say that her son had completely recovered and was completely healthy. So this was just kind of one of these like amazing stories that's just um, kind of typical. He's the patron saint. We don't have patron saints in orthodoxy, but he's considered the patron saint of cancer patients. Okay, on another occasion, and this relates to the image of the weeping um, icon here, um, they're holding vespers in the chapel at the Patriarchal Seminary in Nairobi, Kenya. And the Archbishop is giving a sermon about um, St. Nectarius and kind of exalting him as this great example for Orthodox Christians. And he tells the students that the saints are always with us, beside us, literally surrounding us and listening to us when we talk to them and whenever we ask them for something. The Kenyan hierarch's words were proved true the next morning as he's getting ready to go to, a, uh, to serve liturgy in a nearby village, an altar server runs in and says, um, you know, your grace, you, you need to come see this. There's something happening at the church right now that, that we don't understand. Archbishop Macarius discovered um, that the chapel's icon of St. Nectarius, which is in this picture, is streaming fragrant myrrh from two places, from the gospel book, and you kind of see the um, glow there in the photograph, and from the hand of the saint holding the gospel. His eminence crossed himself, venerated the icon, and said, Lord have mercy, and then he went off to the village to serve liturgy. And when he got back to the seminary, they said, yeah, it continued to stream myrrh until liturgy was over, and it stopped. So this is just something beautiful. This is like in Kenya, you know, in, in his old sea of Alexandria, hundreds of miles from a and they're experiencing this miracle. And I will, um, I will say um, a little, just one thing about my own um, pilgrimage to the saint. I visited places connected to him uh, all three times I've been in Greece. Um, but the second time um, when I came and there was this giant church there, I was really disoriented. And so I'm wandering around this giant church trying to find his reliquary, which is in, the, um, in this new church, which is this silver um, uh, kind of coffin-shaped reliquary. It has his hand, relic of his hand inside. Um, in a kind of a side chapel, but before I even got there, I felt like St. Nectarius um, was like in the room, and next thing I knew, I had my face down on the floor, and I was praying, St. Nectarius, you know, pray for me, and it was like, it was like, I, I, I thought I was looking for him, but he just came and found me, and so by the time I went into his, um, into the chapel and venerated his um, reliquary, I felt like he's already introduced himself. Well, what else is there to say? Um, and it's a lot like when, um, um, I visited uh, San Francisco for the second time, had venerated um, St. John Maximovich in 1998 um, on my honeymoon, and I was coming back for a conference, I thought, I'll just go you know, and visit um, Holy Virgin Cathedral and venerate him again. And so I'm riding on, down Geary Boulevard in this giant like, bus just crammed with people at the end of the workday, and I thought, you know, I haven't really been thinking about St. John over the last couple of years. I kind of, I don't think about him. And immediately, it, the thought just came to me, that he has not forgotten about you for one second. <laughs> you know, and this is, this is kind of the power of the saints and why I um, encourage all of you, if you do go to Greece, to, um, to make a trip to Aeon. It's a really inexpensive side trip from Athens, and it's a beautiful place, and I, I guarantee you. All right, anything I've left out? Any questions? Anything anybody wants to add? I think I kept it under an hour, yes. Okay, good. 
It is hard to follow a movie, let me just say. We never had to do that before. All right, thank you all. Victoria. Yes. What were the specific rumors about him from, Al from Alexandria? That well, the rumors, there are two kind of threads. Of, one of the um, uh, claims that was made about him is that he wanted to usurp the patriarch's position before he was God, to push, to push him, Sophronius, out of the, um, his position um, before he decided to retire. So that was kind of one angle that his enemies were working. But they also claimed that he was having improper relations with some of the women parishioners who came to see him. And, you know, there was never any evidence for this, but this kind of thing kind of haunted him when he came to Greece. And, of course, people accused him of, you know, the nuns being his mistresses. You know, he just could never escape this idea that he was a womanizer. And here's someone who is really so innocent and pure of heart. And, you know, as I was reading about his life, he reminded me a lot of St. Paisios, who also comes from Asia Minor to Greece and brings that pious spirit of the Asia Minor Christians um, into really, into kind of, you know, Western, I mean, it's funny we talk about, you know, secularization today, but to, into the secularized Greece of the 19th century. So a lot of the rumors were about um, immorality, but there was never any proof, there were never any formal charges, and he never had a chance to defend himself. He, he writes a letter to Sophronius near the end of his life, and he says, can you tell me what I'm charged with? And he never got it. Um, but they never took his name out of the book. He's in the, when, you, when you're elevated bishop, they write your name in the, in the book, and he's number 334 on the list, and he's, his name is still there. So he's never Wasn't deposed. there some kind of document of repentance long, much later, like after he was They They did, and um, I think they apologized. He was glorified in 1961. It was about 40 years after his death. And I think in 1992, the... Um, the Patriarchate of Alexandria asked his forgiveness you know, for the wrongs they had done to him. And of course, it's long after any, anybody who was part of it was still alive. It's kind of this black mark on, on that um, Patriarchate. What was his reputation like in the between, between dying and then and being? Well, it was, a, you know, we think that. Um, you know, going to a monastery is a very holy endeavor, um, but a lot of people didn't uh, like what he was doing. It wasn't a popular move. Um, and part of it is you have to, again, go back to imagine the early 20th century in Greece. Um, you know, really, it's, in a lot of ways, um, church life is, is really at a low ebb. A lot of the monasteries are empty. Um, this idea that you're gonna revive monastic life, people are like, that's the past. You know, we need to move into the future. We need to become educated people and engage in commerce. So he got plenty of uh, criticism for um, what he did, especially at women's monastery. For heaven's sakes, you know, that was even less significant. You know, how could someone of his talents, you know, spend his time on this? So you know, so, you know he he continued to receive grief for it. Um, but also, people, um, you know, came as I said, came to talk to him to receive his counsels, and he was. Um, very revered during his lifetime within a certain circle of pious people, but that was really the minority um, at that time. Um, it, it's interesting that, um, you know, in the years since then, really since the, the 1970s, when you have a big monastic revival in Greece, the number of women monastics now exceeds the number of men three to one, okay? So women, there used to be fewer women monastics by far. Um, but now it's like three to one, women to men, if you don't include the men on Mount Athos, which is not a technically part of Greece. A lot of men go to Mount Athos. So. Um, but they're, they're rebuilding um, old men's monasteries that were abandoned. You know, monasteries that had 20,000 monks are now, you have know, groups at 12 nuns rebuilding them. And that's really a, a movement that he's part of at the very beginning, taking an old monastic foundation and reviving it. And there's some wonderful stories about um, from the nuns who have gone into these old abandoned monasteries and found the relics of martyrs and people killed by the Turks. It it's really continues to bring a sainthood into Greece right to this day. Any other questions? Yes. I read yes. recently that his relics were moved to Constantinople. 
I don't know about that, but he, you know, when we talk about his relics, because they've been divided up, you know, as okay. I said, he, there's one relic of his that's still at the monastery chapel, the little church that I visited in 92. There's one at the big church, and then we have a relic in our own chapel, right? So, um, I don't know what they moved, but um, I'm sure he's still a presence in, on a and 